and now we move back to um, to our last presentation of the day, last but not least, certainly. And our speaker is Reed Nishikawa, who is familiar to um, to the Oli Foundation and uh, has spoken several times for Oli. Um, Nate Reed is, uh, let me see. It's the title of his talk, Essential and Creative Strategies. And Reed is PharmD, Director of Research and Coordinator of Clinical Services with NutriShare. So the mic is yours, Reed. Okay. Um, can you hear me, Joan? We can hear you. Okay, perfect. Well, what I thought I would share in the next 25 minutes or so is some of what we've been experiencing over what seems to be an eternity that relates to drug shortages and ground to nutrition. Although I can cut, I could probably spend many more hours uh, talking about drug shortages in general, but I'm going to try to restrict my comments to um, parental nutrition and how drug shortages have adversely affected us. Um, I just uh, have disclosure of who I work for and who I consult for. So when we talk about this subject of um, drug shortages and parental nutrition, some of the questions that I'd like to try to answer are which components used to compound parental nutrition have been or are, are in short supply? What type of, uh, what are the typical causes of the component shortages? Uh, and that becomes important because if we don't know what the causes are, then we don't know what the potential solutions are or what the timeline to the resolution of the shortage might be. Are there new factors which adversely affect shortages? What are the best sources to provide updated information on PN component shortages? And lastly, what are reasonable strategies to, to effectively, effectively manage PN component shortages? So sometimes this is how we feel in, in, the, in the PN world, trying to make the life-saving formulations that everybody needs is we're trying to balance these discs, these plates on these sticks, like in this, in a circus. And sometimes it really does feel like that because once we get to a point where we think we are okay, then a few more um, shortages occur and now we have to rejuggle things again. So there are resources uh, that we use um, to help us navigate the drug shortage challenges uh, that we face on a daily basis. And those included um, the drug shortage page on the website for Aspen, which is the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. Uh, the drug shortage uh, section of the of the American Society for Health System Pharmacy, ASHP. And then there is the FDA website, which um, is the US Food and Drug Administration. And I'm in frequent communication with the, um, the director of the drug shortage unit. And then there are the manufacturer's website and customer service divisions and then lastly, uh, the University of Utah Drug Information Center uh, tracks these um, shortages um, quite effectively. And I'll show some of that data shortly. So when we're talking about um, the magnitude of the shortages as it relates to PN, historically shortages were limited to just a few components and the duration of the shortage or the crisis seems to be sh relatively short, less than several weeks, no more than a month. And the impact was minimized because there were multiple manufacturers who produced these um, components that are used to make PN or are used um, in conjunction with the PN administration. Now, 
it appears that the shortages have become significantly worse and much more critical and is demanding us to search for alternative methods to solve the problem. So there are a greater number of shortages and the bad thing for all of us is that they last for longer than they ever have. They are now in the duration of months, weeks to months. Um, for example, like we don't expect to see sodium acetate probably till sometime in May. And we've known about that since January. There are also fewer manufacturers. So that means there's consolidation so that if um, one manufacturer has a problem with their um, production line, then that adversely affects the entire country. So then we have to go to the, the root causes of the shortages. So unless we know what the root causes are, then we really don't, don't know how long the shortage may last or how severe it's really gonna be. Some of the, some of the, some of the um, causes are lack of incentives for the manufacturers to produce less profitable drugs. Um, and therefore, what we're seeing is we're seeing a shift on the, on the behalf of the manufacturers to do something to take a less profitable drug and make it profitable. And we've seen that with some of the micronutrients. And we've seen that uh, mo most recently, probably within the last uh, year of ethanol. So it's not that it's not available. It's that they've gone through some regulatory processes so that the, the costs have gone up exponentially. So what happens is that a drug which or a component which may be cost effective, when we do the pharmacoeconomic analysis, what we find is that um, based on the current cost, um, that therapy in some studies is no longer cost effective because uh, the shift in the cost has upset the apple cart. And so therefore, yes, the benefit is still there, but when you look at the cost, the cost becomes astronomical. So it's a complex equation um, of benefit versus cost. Um, then there are raw, there can be raw ingredient shortages so that the components uh, to you to manufacture these um, components to make PN uh, are in short supply or there's a problem in transportation. And so the bottom line is that they don't, the manufacturers don't have the ingredients to make the products that we need. And sometimes there's no, um, light at the end of the tunnel because they can't tell us uh, when, they can't tell us when um, the shortage is gonna be over, when they're gonna get the raw ingredients. Then there are our regulatory issues. Um, and we've experienced this um, historically, but I think that right now, they're really, a, the regulatory issues are not that big of a problem. Sometimes there are, um, FDA inspections of manufacturing facilities, uh, at, and that results in haltage of uh, the manufacturing process, and therefore um, they can't make any product or the product that has been made has to go into quarantine, can't be released until the FDA clears uh, the manufacturing um, line. And so, and then sometimes there's, um, production or manufacturing problems with it that may be related to um, equipment failure, um, quality assurance uh, issues. Uh, and the bottom line is that that results in decreased product being able to be manufactured. 
and then then there are natural disasters. And actually, this has not really happened since the hurricane in the Puerto Rico, where um, one manufacturer of had all their amino acids manufactured on the top of a mountain on an island in Puerto Rico and had no redundancy to have a backup manufacturing in the United States. And so when the hurricane happened, that basically shut down all production of those amino acids and that created a crisis for us. And the last thing I think we talked, I talked about this before is that there's market consolidation. So that means there are fewer manufacturers. So now many of these items are sole sourced so that there's only one manufacturer of, of the components that are used to, to um, compound parental nutrition. If we looked at um, this table, I mean, this graph here, this, if you follow the green line, this goes from 2015 all the way to 2021. And it shows each one of these data points represents the number of actual shortages at the end of each quarter. This was compiled by the University of Utah Drug Information Service. So as you see, the line is pretty flat until somewhere around um, 2017. And then it started to go up. And then it seemed to peak somewhere around 2019. And it hasn't really come down. So what that means is that um, there there are the shortages that are occurring are widespread and they really aren't coming down significantly in terms of frequency so that um, if you look at the last data point there's 264 shortages which is a lot 12 percent of those represent fluid and electrolyte products And then so in 2021, um, they also looked at the reasons for drug shortages and find that um, manufacturing issues represent about 22%, supply and demand around 27%. And then there are regulatory issues and then the smaller uh, pieces of the pie are raw materials. Um, and then there's some regulatory issues and business decisions, perhaps maybe not to produce a certain product. So the, um, the challenges can be variable uh, in terms of the reasons for the drug shortages. But the bottom line is that they all result in um, drug shortages that we faced and have to deal with every day. So now we go to the spectrum of the shortages of the components that we use um, to, manu to compound parental nutrition. And those can vary from macronutrients, which include the amino acid dextrose, sterile water for injection and intravenous lipid emulsions. And Virtually all of these have happened at one, not, not, not exactly at the same time, but perhaps um, at different times. Then there are electrolytes. Electrolytes have plagued us for just continuous number of months. Um, whoever thought we would have a problem getting sodium chloride or KCL, but indeed, um, the concentrated sodium chloride that we use to make, to uh, compound parental nutrition is in short supply. And so, do, so is sodium acetate, which um, um, has resulted in us having to take extraordinary measures to deal with that because as, as much as we'd like to balance the formulas to respond to the shortages, sometimes just adjusting the formula um, may not be enough. 
So I'll get into some of the um, strategies that we use in just a little bit. Okay, then we go to um, trace elements. We used to have multi-trace element combinations which have been discontinued for adults and pediatrics. And then the new uh, trace element combination uh, has only um, four trace elements in there. And then we have individual trace elements. And then some of them have become astronomically expensive. And then we've had shortages with multivitamins, both in adults and pediatrics that's required, that's, that has required us to um, take a different tact in terms of how do we deal with this because we can't just give nothing um, and risk vitamin deficiencies or multiple vitamin deficiencies. Uh, and then as we talked about before, sodium chloride um, and heparin pre-filled syringes have been short in short supply. And so we've had to um, um, carefully track our inventory and, and then make sure that what's, what's being ordered is what they're really being, what's being used. And so if that, if all these things weren't enough to uh, create problems for us, is that the bags that we use to um, mix the PN in have periodically become in short supply in with different sizes and whether they're dual chamber bags or they're single chamber bags, they both, they, they all have had shortages and we've had to like look for alternatives uh, as best we can to deal with these shortages. And then I never thought we would run into the situation where we would have um, a shortage, a shortage of infusion pump tubing due to a manufacturing problem that re resulted us having to switch the type of pump that the consumers were using because um, the tubing for their current pump may not it may is no longer available or it it is probably in in out of stock for um, months on end. And then lastly, um, filters. We never thought that, you know, there would be shortage of, of filters, but, you know, that's complicated our um, process of administration of PN. And it, it appears that what we've done is we make sure that we use filters on all our PN so that none of our PNs that are that that we compound and and the consumers administered are uh, administered in the unfiltered um, in status. Now the current shortages as of um, early April, according to Aspen, are various amino acids, uh, calcium gluconate, various intravenous lipid emulsions, uh, including SMOF. We would have, we were tracking our inventory and our usage, and we had a running um, a spreadsheet that told us based on our current um, inventory and usage, we would know exactly what length of time our inventory would last before it would run out. So then we would have to develop alternate strategies to deal with that. Um, multivitamins and um, both adults and pediatrics have been in shortage. Uh, currently potassium acetate, sodium acetate, the concentrated sodium chloride, sodium phosphates and, um, and potassium phosphates have been in short supply at different points in time. Sterile water is in shortage, but it's not at a critical level yet. Um, then when sodium chloride was a, a problem in terms of shortage, even normal saline bags were in short supply. Then there were shortages of sterile and non-sterile gloves. Uh, when, so we couldn't really give out boxes. We'd have to give out what they would use in a week or in two weeks. There were shortages of mass. Um, there were some shortage of ethanol but the ethanol um, problem uh, that, that we were using the ethanol for ethanol lock was a problem 
not so much on a shortage or availability um, a prop, you know, situation, but it was more the the costs had gone up astronomically, and, and and that's why I said you know there are some studies which looked at the um, cost effectiveness, and in some some studies which, which were just recently published in the in the JPEN, um, they came to the conclusion that the use of ethanol was no longer cost effective. Now, there are different strategies how to use ethanol. Uh, in terms of frequency administration and concentration. So we've used frequency administration and alterations in the, in the concentration to um, make what ethanol we have last for longer because we know that there's no question that the use of ethanol lock will decrease the risk of uh, CLABS in, in, in the, the patients who had, have had a history of um, increased cases or increased risk. Even um, agents that are used to clean the skin, such as chloroprep, were in short supply, so we couldn't dispense a box at a time. And then we were even seeing shortages where we couldn't get the number of syringes, specifically the one in 10 ml syringes um, that we needed. Um, we used 10 ml syringes for um, drawing up the vitamins, the parental vitamins. And there were even shortages of alcohol prep pads. So as you see, um, the, the magnitude of the problem is, is quite significant. So now that we know that almost everything that we uh, use in the administration of and compounding of PN, have been in shortage at some point in time, we sort of have to develop a strategy for the shortage. So we, we, we want to make sure that we review the Aspen recommendations, which are, are on the Aspen website uh, for their recommendations on how to deal with the shortages of multivitamins, uh, intravenous lipid emulsion, trace elements, whether they're in combination or individual, how to deal with amino acid shortages, um, electrolyte and minerals, and, and even L-cysteine. Um, in terms of general strategies, uh, you have to make sure that you follow the resources for drug shortages. Uh, carefully monitor your current inventory status. Implement conservation strategies early and monitor the PM, PN component dosages for appropriateness and utilize oral alternatives uh, if you can, but be aware that there may be problems with malabsorption so that whatever you give may not be absorbed. So you, it takes a, um, a global thought process to figure out what the best thing to do is, best pathway moving forward is. Um, then you have to make changes in the PN formulation to compensate for the individual component shortages, but then realize that you have to balance the formula between the chloride and acetate so that your acid base balance doesn't, doesn't get um, become abnormal. And then make sure you communicate with the manufacturer for your inventory release dates so you know like how long your current inventory is going to last and when you might be able to get additional inventory. Realize that if the manufacturer tells you that on May 1, they were going to release their product most of the people, most of the pharmacies don't um, get their inventory directly from the manufacturer. They, they get them from a local wholesaler. And so if the release from the manufacturer is on May 1, it may take a week to get from, get into the warehouse, maybe as much as two weeks for the inventory to get into the warehouse. And then for you is to show up on the ordering page for that wholesaler so that you can place an order and, uh, and get additional supply. So the consequences of drug shortages are deficiencies. Deficiencies in electrolytes, so you have abnormally low values, trace, element, trace elements, depending on how you manage your trace element dosages, vitamins, and this may depend on depend on how you manage um, 
the administration and frequency of the intravenous multivitamins and essential fatty acid deficiency, depending on which, which intravenous lipid emulsion you use and how you dose it. The electrolyte abnormalities can be um, many and it can be um, oftentimes corrected. There are certain acid-based disorders that happen. Like for example, if you have a very severe shortage of sodium acetate and you don't have sodium acetate and, the, and the, um, there is evidence of um, renal dysfunction and metabolic acidosis, then you either have to give potassium acetate or that you have to do the best you can and give maybe a partial dose of the sodium, sodium acetate and then realize that your inventory may run out. Um, and then I'll get into some other um, solutions in just a little bit. Now, there are, can be changes in hydration status and there can be an in, increase in infection risk if the ethanol is um, eliminated or you don't have as many gloves to use um, for like for sterile dressing changes. So just be aware of all the consequences of these drug shortages. So the strategies for uh, dealing with amino acid shortages are you have to use alternative amino acids, which has, um, and they, ca they can come in different concentrations from 10 to 15 to 20%. Um, you may consider dosage modifications um, to make your inventory last longer. And then be aware of compatibility and stability issues because you, if you have, are going to change the um, dose, then you have to make sure that you follow the aspirin recommendations for um, concentrations that are known to be stable with the different um, intravenous lipid emulsions. Typically, it's 4% uh, amino acid, 10% dextrose, and 2% lipid. And then each each amino acid may have different inherent electrolyte compositions of chloride and, and acetate, and some have phosphorus. So just be aware of what's in the different amino acids. Um, for lipid emulsions, you might use an alternate lipid emulsion if you can't get any um, small for intralipid. Uh, you might consider dosage modifications such as reduced frequency um, or reduce dose. Uh, you have to monitor for essential fatty acid deficiency uh, by laboratory testing and by clinical assessment. Uh, and it's really important to be aware of compatibility and stability issues and make sure that you calculate the final concentration of all your macronutrients, make sure they stay within the aspen recommend, recommended um, guidelines. And then there are also unpublished manufacturer's data for compatibility and stability, and you should try to have copies of those. So in terms of the strategy for dealing with electrolyte shortages, it's important to assess each patient's laboratory data for abnormalities. Uh, consider using IV fluids with additional KCL if indicated. Uh, for sodium chloride shortages, you may have to shift to sodium acetate and then balance the chloride with KCL if possible. If you have a shortage of KCL, you may have to shift it to K acetate and balance the chloride with sodium chloride if possible. And then the one that we're dealing with right now that's severe and probably not expected to be over until probably sometime in May, uh, a sodium acetate shortage, you may have to shift to sodium chloride if possible. Um, you can use some oral alternatives of sodium bicarb. Um, but the sodium bicarbonate tablets, the 650 milligram tablets, only contain 7.7 milligrams per tablet. And so therefore, you have to take a lot, of, you have to take a lot of tablets. And so that oftentimes is not the best choice. And then baking soda contains 57 milligrams per teaspoonful. So that's probably um, the biggest impact you have for the smallest dose and make sure you monitor the labs for metabolic acidosis. And we've been pretty successful at, um, uh, at um, adjusting, making sure, adjusting the 
the acid base status and making sure they don't um, develop um, hyperchloric metabolic acidosis. And then sodium phos, if a shortage, you may have to replace it with KFOS and balance with the other salts of sodium or potassium. And then if you're a shortage, if you have a shortage of KFOS, then you, one alternative is to replace it with sodium phos and balance with the other salts of sodium and potassium. And then calcium gluconate shortages, you can, there's really no other um, IV um, replacement for calcium gluconate that we can effectively use in parental nutrition because you can't use calcium chloride because of the um, incompatibility with the phosphorus in the PN formulation. And so you may have to use oral calcium carbonate. Uh, it's only um, about 40% calcium. So you might have to use quite a bit and um, do more frequent monitoring. And mag sulfate, uh, you have to monitor certainly the dose and your and, and labs. Now, one of the situations that we ran into was uh, at, at one point in time, there was an IV uh, selenium shortages, shortage. And so what we did in the study that we we presented it at the at the Aspen meeting in 2021 was that we evaluated the selenium status in long-term PN uh, patients. There were 57 and 51 adults and six pediatrics. The IV selenium dose in adults was um, a mean of 56 micrograms and pediatric was about 23. Um, and the um, in the in the group that were while they were receiving IV selenium, they're um, in the adult and in the pediatric. They were able to maintain a normal selenium level. And then what we did is, since we couldn't get this IV selenium to make the PN, we used um, an aqueous form of sodium selenate, which contained 95 micrograms per drop, and they would take one drop per day. And then so what we were able to define is that um, in those patients that were getting oral selenium, whether it's by the drops or tablets or capsules, that we are able to um, um, maintain uh, a normal serum selenium in adults and in pediatrics. Um, and then it was interesting that in some of the patients who had lo levels that were lower than we would like, what we found is that uh, compliance was a problem, as, as Dr. Bookman talked about, that they would forget to give themselves um, the oral selenium drops. But when they start to do it, start to administer the, the drops on a daily basis, and they repeat their serum selenium, then it, they normalized. Uh, the mean follow-up on oral selenium uh, was about two and a half months in adults and three months, 3.3 in pediatrics. And so um, we're able to maintain a normal selenium status on oral selenium in 84% adults and 100% of the pediatric patients. Um, in terms of multivitamins, um, this has been one of the most, more longstanding shortages that we've had to experience. Uh, what you do varies by degree of shortage. So we can, we have reduced the days per week of IV multivitamins in order for the um, uh, supply to our inventory to last until we can get it replenished. And then we would supplement it with oral multivitamins so that we would provide the oral multivitamins and have them take it every day. Even when they had short bowel syndrome that we would uh, have them take the oral multivitamins and then monitor them for um, deficiency. The trace element shortages, um, what you do in terms of to respond to a shortage it may vary by the degree of shortage, like what's short, how long the shortage is supposed to be. And we have re made a dosage reduction down to three, maybe uh, if you're on seven days a week PN to go to three days a week um, trace elements and then give a supplemental oral and oral, oral zinc and selenium, and then do more frequent trace element um, laboratory monitoring and make sure you monitor for clinical evidence of 
deficiency, and then reserve full dosages for at-risk patients, including pediatrics and, and very young, young patients. So you always ask yourself as a consumer, what could I do? And that's the challenge is that really there's nothing that you can do to increase the pharmacy inventory, but you can take the oral vitamins or selenium or, or take oral rehydration salts to minimize GI tract losses. Um, communicate with your pharmacist related to any changes in your PN formulation and what it means for you. And you may require more frequent laboratory monitoring. So in summary, um, it's very important to monitor your, our, our inventory for PN component shortages. Utilize a um, policy procedure to react to drug shortages, to develop alternative plans to respond to shortages, use oral supplements as necessary, and uh, utilize the resources to assist in uh, responding to shortages that are like at the Aspen, the ASHP, FDA, or our Institute for Safe Medic Medical Practices. Um, and then monitor for clinical deficiency and respond to the shortages early. Develop a plan and an algorithm on like how you're gonna re react so you can see an algorithm and they'll give you a visu visual roadmap on how you will deal with shortages and, and what you're gonna monitor for and how you're gonna make your dosage adjustments. And then oftentimes what we're facing is not a single electrolyte or trace element shortage. It can be multiple um, shortages. So you may have to develop an, uh, several alternatives for different component shortages. So what we, what we're having to do to, to make sure these dishes don't crash is that we have to be vigilant and we have to um, track our inventory. We have to be more clinically aware of what's going on and what it means to change the dose or frequency of the administration of these different elements that are in shortage. So it's not something that's easy to do. And, um, but it's something that's necessary if you want to provide the best quality care and best pharmacy services to the consumers that need the PN so desperately. So I guess what I can say is that we may not be able to see all the answers and they may be below the clouds as in this picture, but then we have to do the best we can with this potential potential solutions that we have and um, and then try to make sure that whatever we do, we do it safely and effectively um, so that we make the formula changes, we monitor what we're doing and make sure that we don't induce complications that we, and that we do it safely. And um, that's all the questions. That's all that I have to share with you today. What, we, what we're having to do with shortages is not easy, and um, but it's something that we have to do because we have no alternative but to deal with the shortages that we're faced with. Anyway, thanks very much. I'll be glad to answer any questions. And I'll let Lisa take over the Q&A portion. Thank you so much, Reid. I think we need another cahoots game to lift us up before we before we go on our way to digest all of that. Woo. I read. Um, I I had thought we might wrap up without questions, but we only have one really that I think that um, you could maybe answer today. And if we don't get to others, we can do it by email. But um, the one question I thought you might be able to answer was in regards to. Um, the sodium acetate shortage. Uh, it was, can you address how to address clinical care for a short bowel patient, short bowel syndrome patient with high stool output during the shortage of sodium acetate? Um, we thought long and hard about that. Um, the sodium acetate shortage is real and the, the shortage is gonna last for 
longer than most people have inventory. So we had to develop a strategy on how to deal with the shortage um, without, without any sodium acetate, because we know that um, the inventory that most people have will not last until May or June. And when they tell us May, I don't consider that as a, a hard date because I, I, I don't want to put my hopes on that date because I've been disappointed too many times and that May 1 date turned into May 15th and then they go, well, it's going to be another couple of weeks and another couple of weeks. And, and so I just have to put our contingency plan in place. So what we've done is we looked at liquid products that they use in renal failure for metabolic acidosis. And we didn't feel that uh, based on the dosages that were needed, that that was a viable alternative. We looked at the um, use of oral sodium bicarbonate tablets, but they only provide 7.7 .7 milligrams per, for a 650 milligram tablet. So you'd have to take a lot. So if you're getting like 150 milli, milliquins of sodium acetate, uh, and you have to replace it with sodium chloride. Well, you need you need about 150, um, roughly 150 milliquins of, of acetate or bicarbonate. It's a one-to-one -one ratio because um, acetate that you give in the parental nutrition goes through the Krebs cycle and it becomes bicarb. Um, so what we're doing is, remember I, I said that one one teaspoonful of bicarb um, is equal to 57 milliquins of, of bicarb. So that's what we're using. And then we're having people put it in like food, like pasta. Um, and so, and then you can divide it throughout the day. So even if you're taking two teaspoonfuls a day, then you can hide it, whether it's in, in, in pasta or put it in, piece of bread or some, you know, some, some way that you're not taking just straight bicarb, but you try to put it in something that would mask the, the flavor of sodium bicarb, of baking soda. But that's the most, you know, the best, you know, strategy that we can ha have to give as close we, as we can to the dosage that is needed, um, that's, most, that's most palatable. So we, we've gone to the sodium bicarb, uh, baking soda. Thanks, Reed. Joan, I think back to you and wrap up. Back to me. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank Reed for ending on that note. I mean, how about just one positive thought to end, end your participation? Well, I guess if I was to say um, something about the shortages, you know, you always try to say, okay, how is that, how is that giving us something positive? Well, it shows us that um, as a pharmacy, we can't, we can't say that the shortages are not happening. So this is a situation where you, 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 the way you look at the situation is, is the half, the cup that's half full or half empty. So we have to look at it as it's half full, at least we can have alternatives. So what it does to us as, as, as a pharmacy is that it makes us think deeper and more um, thoroughly as clinicians to try to find solutions for the people that desperately need the PN and its components as a life-saving um, therapy. So, and we know that they're pretty much helpless to, to affect the degree, of the degree and magnitude of shortage, but it's up to us to minimize the adverse effects that, that 
you know, we're seeing because of the shortages and try to minimize those and try to make people's lives as normal as normal as possible uh, in, in, in face of the multiple shortages that are occurring for uh, very long durations of time. That, that's a good message. And I think we've learned a lot about the importance of the pharmacist's role in getting us through the drug shortages. So thank you so much, Reed.